Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers for uh, this, uh, their kind invitation. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me here uh, to be here today uh, for uh, this presentation. I'm going to talk to you about a technology that we have developed uh, in our company, uh, which is called Logorix. Uh, we started this project in collaboration with the Institute, the Swiss Institute uh, uh, of uh, Technology in Zurich and the University Hospital also in Zurich. Uh, the project aims at developing an oral, a specific oral contrast agent uh, for GI inflammatory lesions. Just to give you a little bit of a background as uh, to where I come from, so I, Augurix is a startup company that I, we co-founded back in 2007. And uh, we started it, um, our main activities in the celiac disease field. And uh, uh, we have currently uh, developed and commercialized one uh, product, which is a point of care test for uh, screening uh, celiac disease. And working in celiac disease, finally, we, we, we thought it was interesting to be able to provide uh, gastroenterologists with tools that were not only able to screen, but also to diagnose and confirm the diagnosis. And obviously, the, these led us to uh, endoscopy. And uh, we were rapidly confronted with the different challenges that you can find in endoscopy, and especially in the celiac disease field where you have to identify specific uh, celiac disease lesions. So this is a little bit of the background that I just wanted to give you. Um, my talk, and this is the content of uh, my presentation, uh, aims at looking at the challenges that we have in endoscopy. Uh, and then I will uh, develop further all the oral contrast agents, its use in clinics, and the description of the technology and where we stand right now. So in terms of challenges, as you, can, as you probably all know, coming from the GI field, uh, visualizing a lesion is not always easy. It's sort of like looking for a, a needle in a haystack sometimes. And, uh, uh, and this is, uh, as you can see here, exemplified by the tennis court. Um, and this often leads to taking biopsies, which are in normal tissues. Uh, and this obviously has a, a cost which is not uh, negligible. Uh, it has been uh, evaluated to about roughly $700 million per year just due to this unnecessary biopsies in normal tissue. So how can we overcome this challenge? Uh, how can we really pinpoint the lesions and go straight to that and avoid all these uh, unnecessary examinations? So in this context, there has been several uh, development, technological development that has been done. Uh, one of them is confocal laser endomicroscopy. This is a technology that is coming gently into clinical practice, more in the university centers, but uh, you can see um, coming in a, in a more regular basis. Uh, their main applications is Barrett's esophagus, microcolitis, and uh, obviously celiac disease. Uh, however, this technology will not develop unless there's really some new developments into new contrast agents, which allows for molecular tagging and true in vivo diagnostic endoscopy. So there's, there's here a, a quite, quite a need uh, to fill in uh, meeting with these new technologies. Other approaches are based on uh, image enhanced endoscopy. Um, this technology is really based on two methods. One approach is a dye-based method, and that relies on the different dyes you can see here, Lugol's, indigo carmine, and, and methylene blue, which is probably the most used. Uh, and the idea behind using these dyes is really to enhance surface topography, meaning if you look here, and then you probably know that, if you look here on the slide, uh, when you spill uh, methylene blue over the mucosa, then you can better see the lesion, which is right here. Um, the, other, uh, the other approach is an equipment-based method, meaning that uh, you manipulate the light sources or uh, the captured image to better visualize, uh, in, in this context, the microvessels of uh, the mucosa. And uh, as you probably know better than I do, uh, when there are abnormal, abnormal microvessels in, uh, in the mucosa, you can be quite sure there's probably a lesion behind that. 
And uh, this can be done by uh, different types of methodology, either column enhancement, narrow band enriching, or ice band. However, unfortunately, the major issue with uh, all of these methodology is really a non-specific technique. So it's still not, uh, okay, it helps, but it, again, it's not uh, specific. So what we, <clears throat> what we aimed at doing is really to create uh, uh, a neural contrast agent that can be used uh, with standard endo uh, endoscopy uh, equipment to really specifically highlight uh, certain regions. And uh, the use case of this would be uh, to ingest this as an oral pill or as an oral solution 12 to 20 hours prior to endoscopy um, depending on if it's a upper or lower procedure, and to be able to highlight uh, the area of interest with standard endoscopy equipment. And uh, this would, uh, highlighting these specific areas really allows a better sampling uh, for tissue biopsy and referral to uh, pathology. Um, now just these coming slides is really aims at describing this technology, where we stand and uh, where we are. So the principle here is to have a, a big carrier, uh, which is a, a polymer. It's an assembly of different monomers with specific physical biochemical uh, properties. And uh, this uh, carrier allows the binding of biomarker molecules, and it is quite flexible and robust in the sense that it allows uh, to bind peptides, small molecules, big molecules such as antibodies, or even oligonucleotides. And uh, obviously what is also required is a dye. It could be a fluorescent dye, but it also, also can be uh, like a methylene blue dye uh, to visualize all this. What it looks like, it's linear molecules, quite big ones, with molecular weight that is over 55 kilodaltons. And this is important because it allows a non-absorption within the body of, this, of these uh, molecules. So um, one of the major key attributes of this vehicle is that it is not biodegradable, meaning that uh, the, either the fluoret fluorescent dye that we have here or the biomarker uh, is linked in a covalent way meaning that covalent things are so strong that uh, even in harsh um, either pH or, or harsh enzymatic activity, there will be no uh, cut in the, in the link, so the, the, the vehicle will really stay as it is, as a, as a, as a whole carrier. Uh, and uh, and this, is, this is extremely important because if we have like binding of small peptides and the small peptides are not covalently linked, Still into the organism, and we don't know the effect it will have within the organism. Um, these are a few of examples of the fluorescent dyes that can be used. Um, the major one is fluorescein, FIPC, as you probably know. Uh, basically, this is the, the only one that is currently approved for um, uh, use in clinics. It has one major drawback is that uh, it uh, emits wavelength as the, other, the natural other fluorescence of a human tissue. So it can be, uh, the way we have to analyze images has to be calculated to, to subtract the other fluorescence of the natural tissue to see if it has something. So it's, it can be a little bit tricky. Uh, the other ones emit in a high wavelength, higher wavelength, uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately they're currently being tested in clinics and trials right now, but they haven't been approved yet for clinical use on a regular basis. Um, one of the experiments that we carried over is the resistance to GI tract, because this is important. If you want, if you want a carrier to bring the biomarker correctly to the correct regions, you need this carrier to be really uh, completely protective uh, over the biomarker. So we did a resistance to GI tract. What we did is we, um, we used a gastric fluid, simulated gastric fluid, simulated in uh, intestinal fluid, and then we, uh, uh, we incubated with the uh, bio, which is the, main, the internal link that we used for our, for our oral contrast agent, with the intestinal fluid. And as you can see here, um, the, the blue and the black one are superposable. If there would have been 
degradation, we would have been, uh, we would have seen a lower uh, black curve here. And so there, there we have no uh, product degradation either in gastric fluid or in intestinal fluid, uh, suggesting that uh, basically there's no, no, no change. One of the other things that uh, uh, is key for such a, such a product is uh, its affinity for GI tract. Uh, it has to be protective and it has to be neutral because otherwise, uh, if it goes, we would get non-specific binding. So it can be a little bit tricky. So that we did with uh, turbidity assays. Um, <clears throat> we incubated uh, different varying uh, polymers with uh, uh, different ratios of mucin uh, with pHs varying from 1.2 to 7.4. And here, you can see here, this is the, the positive control and polylysin, which has high affinity for mucin. And these are uh, the different uh, ratios of polymers that we used. And as you can see here, there's absolutely no affinity for mucin whatsoever, uh, independently of the varying pH that we have. So we really truly have a neutral virion. <coughs> One of the key experiments that uh, we, we've done recently is to be sure that uh, we have non-bioavailable carrier, meaning that this carrier is not in any way absorbed by uh, the, the, the body. Uh, and that we did, this absorption study was carried in, uh, at the University of Navarra in, in Spain. Uh, what we did is we marked our contrast agent with radioactive technician. And uh, we fed, uh, we, for, we used two groups of mice one control group, which was healthy, with no leaky intestine, and a second group of mice, which is the assess group. Um, it's a model, a mouse model of colitis, human colitis, which was uh, developed in Professor Weller's uh, lab at the University of Zurich. And the idea is to administrate dextran sulfide sodium, 2%, in the drinking water of mice for about a week. And this induces an inflammatory process with uh, blood appearing in the feces. So when this happens, which takes about a week, uh, we fed the mice with our oral contrast agent marked with technetium. And then uh, after four hours, uh, the mice were under anesthesia. We did some SPECT CT imaging to see where the contrast agent was located. And uh, we repeated uh, this experiment after 24 hours, and then we sacrificed the mice, we harvested the organs, and then we looked at the radioactivity measurements with the uh, gamma, gamma camera to see uh, if there was any residual uh, radioactivity in the, the different uh, organs. So here's the results uh, from this uh, study. So in healthy mice, uh, here you can see examples of two individuals which were fed on uh, the oral contrast agent. So most of uh, the agents are really in the intestine. Free technician stays in the stomach. Free technician is known to have affinity for stomach, which is, which, which is makes sense. And uh, here after 24 hours, everything was cleared away, both in the oral contrast agent and in the free technician. So there's nothing uh, in these healthy mice after 24 hours. Uh, when you look at the BSS group in plain mice, uh, you can see here that after 24 hours again, we have affinity within the intestine. A leaky intestine shows here in, with free technician that it is uh, it's, it's getting out of the, of the intestines. And after 24 hours, uh, most of it is cleared away in the, in the mice fed with our oral contrast agent. However, with free technician, since it's a small molecule, it tends to spread within the, uh, within the whole organism. Um, what we looked at, these, these are the, the table uh, with the, representing the data with all the radioactivity uh, taken, residual radioactivity within the different organs. And uh, uh, we looked uh, we look here, these are the values for both the healthy mice and the BSS mice. So basically, uh, the levels that we measure are very, very low, uh, meaning that uh, we cannot say that, we can say that there's virtually no residual activity. Um, we 
see that obviously there is a difference between these two groups, meaning that uh, um, with, an, uh, with an inflamed intestine, there, there is some uh, radioactivity that probably lasts a little bit longer. However, if you look uh, with values uh, with a precondition, it's about 1,000 times more. So we really can say that uh, our carrier is capable of taking everything and dumping it into the system. <coughs> Um, then what we did is we wanted to play a little bit with our carrier, saying, okay, it's, it, it has some interesting features, now how can we, can we prove that we can bind a little bit of everything onto it? So these are the binding experiments, in vitro binding experiments that we have carried out, carried over. So one of them is uh, in a mouse model with a, a peptide uh, specific for the formation in mice. And uh, we used a specific uh, dye, which is dye line 618. Uh, we also did some experiments using a, a pig column. And that, here we wanted to prove that we could fix some antibodies, which is much larger molecules. And in the human, uh, we used different fluorescent dyes. These are resection samples from uh, uh, colorectal cancers. So here are the, the results. <clears throat> from these binding experiments. So the first one is the IVD mouse model. It's the PSS colitis model that I just before uh, described to you, which was uh, uh, elaborated by Professor Rutler at the University of Zurich. So the idea is to harvest the column, do a fixation in a CT, and then cryostat uh, the, the tissues. And then we incubated uh, these tissues with the uh, e-oral contrast agent with this peptide specific for inflammation in mice with the dye lines, and uh, we analyzed the whole thing under a thorough microscope. And here you can see on the optical side, uh, I hope you can see, I'm not sure it's not that big of a load. Um, it should, yeah, maybe if you lower the light, that'd be great. <laughs> experiments that we carried on, on samples of colorectal uh, resections. Uh, these also were drawn from patients uh, from the University Hospital of Zurich. Uh, then again, we bound these uh, with uh, antibodies. These are the, the uh, results with antibodies uh, and, and, and a peptide for inflammation. And again, like the mice model, we analyzed the whole thing under sterile microscope. And you can see here uh, fluorescence uh, being really more in a spread-like form on the apical side of the lesion. And uh, these are antibodies for mucin, really like a, like a sort of a linear uh, marking here on the apical side, really uh, underlining the, the mucus layer within the intestine. Uh, the healthy pig model, so again, uh, it, it all amounts to harvesting uh, pieces of, uh, of column with the, with the pig. Uh, incubating them with uh, the oral contrast agent marked here with another different fluorescent dye. And uh, we used three different uh, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, that targets both goblet cells, uh, crypts, and both goblet cells and crypts uh, in order to have like a sort of a uh, three-dimensional um, uh, visualization. Here I've just put one example because gives really interesting punctiform uh, visualization of the NPCFDR uh, within the, the goblet cells in the brain. Um, the fields of application, and this is where we stand right now, uh, the 
because okay, we, we have we have the carrier, we have shown that it has some interesting properties in terms of uh, non-biodiversity, in terms of uh, 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 neutral, it's protected. Uh, but now, how can we use that, and, uh, and where does it stand for? So now we're currently we have established a few fields of application, and we're currently looking for partnerships to develop uh, uh, different potential applications uh, using our our carrier. So one of them is is IDD that we have been discussing with Professor Rogler in, in, at the University of Zurich. Um, so the idea behind this is, uh, as you probably know better than I do. Uh, IDD really can present in two different forms. It can either have an intermittent non-evolutive presentation, which means that uh, for many years it just wants to be stable, and more or less you can uh, supervise your patients with uh, simple corticosteroids, aminosalicylate, immunosuppressive drugs, and unfortunately you have uh, about a 20% who will develop some chronic fibrotic presentation. These will clearly benefit uh, from the latest uh, treatments, which are biological. So, in order to avoid really uh, treating everybody with biologicals, it, can we stratify the patients and find a way uh, with uh, maybe early markers uh, to identify the patients who are going to present with this fibrotic form? So, this is where we stand in terms of, uh, of IDD potential applications. One other application, and this is a much broader, I'd say, uh, field, and, and, and uh, you, you probably are more, again, more aware of than, than I am, but it's really the identification of dysplastic and, and flat regions, which is something that is uh, uh, quite a, a hurdle, if I understood correctly, from an endoscopist's point of view, uh, because when you look at here, here you have a, a region, but you can easily miss it. Here you have some dysplasia, but again, you can easily miss it. And uh, these types of lesion uh, 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 are prevalence are up to close to 10% in the general population, which is, which is really quite considerable. And there is a high risk in this type of population of developing invasive carcinoma of up to 33%. So there's really a need to, to early identify these lesions and, and have something that is more specific. And, and maybe a second point would be to increase specificity in follow-up and uh, after surgical treatment to be able, again, to catch any recurrent uh, lesions that would uh, occur within the, within the patient. And finally, and I, I, I'm ending with this because this is where we come from, uh, celiac disease. Obviously, uh, celiac disease, as I said, it's uh, quite a hurdle to, to really be able to pick up uh, the villus atrophic lesions within uh, with endoscopies. Um, it has been, now the guidelines say that a minimum of four biopsies is, are required for really truly diagnosing uh, celiac disease. It's not always done. So if we could have like a tool that really is appropriate biopsy sampling, I think that would really probably make endoscopy's life a little bit easier. So in terms of the next steps, um, <clears throat> there's a, just list them on. Huh? There's a lot of uh, clinical studies that still need to be carried over on our side. Preclinical stu studies with uh, a lot of animal models, toxicity in animal models, and obviously also the big chunk, which is uh, the proper clinical study. Validating the effect efficacy of neurotoxic agent versus endoscopy alone, and then obviously the follow up of secondary effects. But the most important here, and this is why I ended up. Uh, with this one is we're really looking for partnerships with promising biomarkers. So if you know any anybody or if you have some ideas in the field, we'll be happy to discuss and, and potentially collaborate with you guys. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions. Many thanks, Professor, for this evening and presentation. Have you developed a specific uh, marker for things like this is still in the process. This is why, really, basically, uh, we're really looking for partnerships here, collaborating with uh, with the academia, because we alone, as a, as a company, it's it's really difficult to, to get into this field, and uh, we we have a carrier. We know that this is this is where where our know how is, 
but uh, biomarkers, uh, we, we've looked into some though, uh, but uh, nothing that really is uh, so far that promising. So between IBD and colorectal cancer, you'll have a, a few billion <laughs> doses to give because uh, <laughs> all the screening uh, programs are going up for colorectal cancer and for IBD. This would really cut down a that lot of the work. We, we've done we've done some uh, uh, phage display study uh, on IBD tissue, which uh, we we are now we, we have a peptide which is quite interesting. We're we're, we're in a, I can't disclose right now unfortunately. It is a molecule with a, a lot of homologies for an adhesion molecule, so it could be interesting for both uh, IBD and colorectal cancer. But it's in the process of being evaluated. So, but, uh, you're right. Any other questions?